Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast for Saturday, December 2nd, 2017. We are finally in the home stretch, folks. Woo! 2017's almost over! How many weeks we got left? Let me quick check. Let me count the weeks. We got the one, two, three, four, five, counting today. Ah, ah, ah. That's right, folks. There's five Saturdays left of the year, which means that there are five, count them, five. More episodes of the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast coming your way. But, anyway, what do I got to talk about this week? Well, the live-action Gintama movie is going west. And personally, I would like it to go the other direction and back east. <clears throat> Bakugan! Remember that? Yeah, well, it's getting a new TV series, and it's planned for either 2018 or 2019. BuzzFeed is apparently laying off 100 staffers after missing a revenue goal. Ouch. Apple has made the biggest screw-up in computer history. And released a security update to fix this. I'll explain what it is. Ultraman manga is getting an anime series in 2019. Which in all honesty might be pretty cool. I like Ultraman. Vidme has shut down its user generated video service. I'm going to explain that. And Shonen Jump reveals its poster for 1990 for the 90s uh, retrospective exhibition. I'm assuming it's 1990s. But anyway, uh, 90s retro ex- retrospective exhibition. That's pretty cool. All this and a bag of chips this week on the absolutely completely random podcast. And you know the deal by this point in time, folks. A Rhodes hyphen 2012 on eBay for all your wonderful oddity trading card strangety needs. Come on, you know you want something, a cheap little gift, parts for something that you want to fix up. I have pretty much anything up on eBay. And I'm still adding new stuff up. December just started, so I got some stuff that's been relisted, some stuff that's getting added up. So don't count me out just yet. I'm still not down. But you can check all that out on my eBay page, A A R H O A D S hyphen 2012 on eBay. You can also follow me on Twitter at Otaku Roads. So, how was my week? Let's, let's start off like we start off every single uh, podcast episode. How was Andrew's week? I hate night shift. Three words that could express my entire week. I hate night shift. I uh, worked four days this week. I am not a fan of night shift, nor will I ever be a fan of night shift. I have come to the conclusion that night shift is perfect for individuals that don't have a life, don't have family or friends, and are completely entirely alone. So basically drifters. That is who night shift is perfect for. Because if you're doing night shift or overnight, you will not interact with any living people other than your co-workers. If you have a day off, you're probably going to be asleep. It messes with your sleep schedule. It messes with your mind. <clears throat> you end up getting really sick. Just an entire screw you plethora of stuff that happens. But anyway, I'm dealing with night shift yet for the holidays. Yay, holidays. I got five, count them, five days coming up this coming week. I can hear the count from Sesame Street laughing at me. Uh, otherwise, downloaded a new game from my tablet. It's not too bad. Uh, it's Naruto X Boruto uh, Ninja Voltage. Not too bad. Though I do have a couple complaints about it. Um, because it crashed my tablet five times. And that was after I played it for a decent amount of time. So like, let's, so like I basically get through uh, two or three missions... Two or three story mo or two or three story battles, and I immediately go to uh, either do a attack mission where you attack other players, or a special mission where you can get like fragments to get more characters, power them up, etc. And all of a sudden, it's 
the screen flashes white and then it reboots itself. Other than that, the game's fun. It's a little short. Uh, story mode's only like five chapters. It only recently came out, though. Like The earliest review was back on uh, the 22nd of November, so it's still fairly new yet. So that's something I figure a uh, system update will take care of. That'll knock that out. But otherwise, it's not a bad game. I like it. I mean, if they can fix the issue with the bug, that'd be nice. Because it's not my tablet. That's the interesting part. Because I can play... Because when it rebooted, I immediately went into like my Contest of Champions, uh, Digimon Heroes, Digimon Lynx, um, Exo Gears 2 Arena, Battle, Arena Combat, and all of those, Puzzles and Dragons, all that worked. YouTube worked. Uh, Webtoons worked. All that worked. It's just that it just glitches it, that it freezes it, and it has to reboot, and that's what pisses me off. And it happens so sporadically that it annoys me. But otherwise, it is a fun game. It's good for Naruto fans. It's still in its infancy, I will say that. But it's not bad. Other than that, I've actually started putting up some reviews. Yay! Uh, so far, I have two of them up. I pre-recorded these. Uh, on Tuesday, when I had off that night from work, <laughs> I uh, quick pre-recorded a few reviews that I can fix up and plop up uh, during the week. I have a couple more yet to go that I can fix up in video form and upload to YouTube. So after that, I will start looking into some of the other stuff because uh, I got a request from one of my fans to review, I think it was the Gaming Beaver. And I've never heard of that, so I'm going to have to check that out. And there's just so much other stuff that I want to talk about and review. It's like, I'll throw my two cents into this. I have a new Andrew Rance video that is going up uh, about the same time this podcast is going up. And this is one that I actually thought about, ironically, while checking out eBay. Uh, it's kind of funny because I'm constantly in, in the market trying to find Transformers. From like Beast Wars or really good uh, Transformers. And I've been trying to get my hands on Optimus Prime from Fall of Cybertron because that is a really cool design, or at least just a really good Optimus Prime. And then I keep checking out Megatron because when I, when I was growing up, I always had the feeling that if you got one action figure, you had to get a second one. If you got a good guy, you needed a bad guy for it to battle against. Yin and Yang. Granted, I could just use my imagination. That's what my mom told me to do a few times. Just use your imagination at home. You're not getting two of them. You're only getting one. Just use your imagination when you get home and have it fight something else. Which I did. I will admit that. I did. But if they were on sale, it's like, okay, try to find two of them. One good guy, one bad guy that you wouldn't mind having and, you know, be done with it. Or I would get two good guys if I had, like, a couple really, like, decent characters at home that I could have them go up against. So I had a lot of fun using my imagination when I was growing up. It's something that is lacking with a lot of people nowadays, I think. But anyway, I'm constantly trying to find that, and that was the source of this Andrew Rance video. <coughs> and it's geared at Hasbro. Wonderful Hasbro. But otherwise, it's not too bad. And like I said, that's pretty much been my week and everything that I've been doing. But you're not here to hear you're not here to listen to me talk about my life. Otherwise, I would call this Andrew's Life Podcast and not the absolutely completely random podcast. So let's jump into the podcast and let's get this started, shall we? Okay, so the live action Gintama movie is coming to the West. Well, okay, it's going to the USA, which is in the West from Japan, on a uh, home video. So basically DVD, Blu-ray, what have you. Because remember, back in the day, it used to be VHS. That was home video. Now it's basically DVD, Blu-ray, Blu-ray DVD, digital HD, what have you. That's home video now. I know I'm old. Remember that, kids. I'm old. But anyway... It's slated for a March 6th release and was confirmed by Anime News Network that it will release 
Uh, Go USA confirmed with Anime News Network, I should say, that it will release the live action film of Hideki Sorochi's Gintama manga in North America on DVD, Blu ray disc, and DVD combo pack, and digital HD. Why don't you just stream it on your eyeballs, too, while we're at it? Just, let's pull a Jordy LaForge here from Star Trek, and let's just get the visor, and you plop onto your eyeballs, and right there is your movie. No need for DVDs or Blu-rays. No, 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 no. S beautiful, stunning, high-definition picture. You just attach the visor. Oh my God, I'm watching the movie. And I just probably gave some tech companies a great idea there. I, knowing my luck, that's just what happened. Holy crap, I just gave freaking tech companies a great idea. <coughs> so, uh, the film opened in Japan back in July. It earned 980 million yen, or 8.9 million American, uh, in its first four days. I was never a fan of Gintama. I never liked Gintama, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm not a huge of a fan of it. It's not for the fact that I don't like it, it's the fact that I just couldn't get into it. Yes, I did read the manga when it was in Shonen Jump. Yes, I have seen bits and pieces of the anime. No, I'm not a fan of either one. I just, I'm not. It's my opinion, it's my prerogative if I don't want to like something. I just don't. Uh, the film also inspired a live-action net show that debuted on Docomo's DTV streaming service on July 15th. So, ironically, a day afterwards? Come on. Yeah, one day after the film's opening. Yeah, that's funny. So, you can go watch the film in theaters on the 14th, and then you can watch a live-action net show the next day online. That, that's incredibly entertaining there. Uh, the film already had its Canadian premiere at the uh, Fantasia or Fan yeah I was Fantasia International Film Festival or F I F F. I'm just making an acronym for it. That's all it is. Uh, back in July, and will also screen in the United States, Canada, Germany, Spain, and Central and South America. So let's do that again, folks. It was all, it will also be screening in the United States, Canada, Germany, Spain, Central and South America. Huh. Yakko teaches me the world, the nations of the world by Yakko Warner, and I still know it years later. Uh, the film is going to get a sequel tentatively titled Gintama Part 2 next summer, so in 2018. Uh, Sriracha began the manga back in 2004. It continues to be ranked among the top-selling manga in Japan. The manga has more than 50 million copies in print in Japan, and Viz Media published the first 23 volumes in English. Shuisha published the manga's 70th volume on October 4th. The manga entered its final arc in July of 2016. The final arc in July of 2016. If it's still going... If it's still going two years later, that's one hell of a long arc. Uh, Crunchyroll is currently streaming the Gintama Season 4 anime, which premiered back on October 1st. The new anime began with the Porori arc, but will also adapt the manga's final Silver Soul arc. So for those of you that are interested in the live-action Gintama movie, good news is coming to the U.S. on home video... March 6th, so you can save up your holiday money, and you can get yourself a copy day one when it comes out. There you go. There's your there's your happy thing. You know what to wish for for the holiday. For those of you that celebrate Christmas and New Year's, you can go, I uh, can you get me an, like an Amazon gift card, or a PayPal gift card, or an eBay gift card, or a Walmart Best Buy gift card? I, I want to get a movie when it comes out, but it's not out yet. Just Yeah, there you go. Brilliant idea, brought to you by me. You're welcome. <laughs> but anyway, like I said, I'm just not that big a fan of the manga series. It to me, <clears throat> to me, it just really didn't. It didn't drive with me. It, it didn't click. It wasn't something that I thought was entertaining. And don't get me wrong, I've read shonen manga, so I know the basic formula for it. At least for what Gintama goes by, I know the basic formula. 
I'm just not a fan of it. It, it. To me, it just seems like it's way too idiotic, way too slow, and it's spoon-feeding you its plot. At least that's how I felt reading the manga, so I'm like, yeah... Now, I'm just going to skip over this. When each copy of Shonen Jump came, I just skipped right over the... It's like, okay, da, 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 da. Okay, here's what... I just skipped right over it. It's like, yeah, I'm not even going to read this. I skipped right over it. So, but there you go, March 6th. The new release comes out. You can pick it up. Sequel's coming out in summer of next year. Oh! Yeah, ain't that nice. Uh, where would we be in the world if it wasn't for BuzzFeed? Well, probably the same place we are now, but just a lot happier. For those of you that don't know what BuzzFeed is, it's an international and global joke at this point. Um, and the way I can specify that, there was, a, there was an online series on Facebook that I saw, and it actually had its own site. It was an interactive game series called Charlie Gets Fired. And one of the episodes, Charlie got a job working at BuzzFeed. Poor Charlie suffers from user interruptus. Where basically, three options will come up, you click one of the options, and Charlie will sadly say the option and roll with it. Usually ending up getting his ass fired. Ironically, though, the BuzzFeed episode was the one that he actually wasn't doing too bad until he made a comment about how an entire room of monkeys could literally do what BuzzFeed does and still come up with it. They could just fake the news and still get money, which is what got him fired because then the you know big fat boss guy that was in the thing said, yeah, you know, you're right. You're fired. I can just hire a whole bunch of monkeys. Pay him in bananas. Yeah, that works out better. I don't got to pay any of you money. Yeah, you're all fired. And that's what happened. So, why am I bringing this up? Well, like I said, BuzzFeed's sort of a joke. I don't personally use it. But good news. Oh, well, bad... Well, let me rephrase that. It's not good news for the 100 people that are basically getting laid off. But it's good news for people that are tired of fake news and having to wonder if stuff on certain sites is legitimate or not. Because then this might lower some of the content. I don't mean to sound uh, like an asshole with this, but that's the point I'm getting at. So BuzzFeed is laying off 100 of its staffers after it failed to meet a revenue goal. They announced this on Wednesday. I gotta scroll back up here a second. Okay. They announced this on Wednesday to lay off roughly 100 employees after it missed its revenue estimates. BuzzFeed's president will also lose his job. Oh, that sucks. Uh, instead, becoming a senior advisor at the digital news outlet. Oh, well, then you're not really losing your job. You're just getting a transfer. The cuts are expected to focus on employees in BuzzFeed's business and sales sections, as well as operations in the United Kingdom. So it's not even affecting anybody in the U.S., but the United Kingdom. So, yeah, okay. I, like I said, I don't mean to sound like an asshole with this, but in all honesty, whenever I hear the words BuzzFeed, I instantly cringe. Because nothing, I think, from them comes legitimately. And that's the problem. Um, well, The Wall Street Journal reported earlier this month that BuzzFeed is, is expected to fall significantly short of its revenue goal, missing it by as much as 20%. Uh, let's see here, who... Okay, BuzzFeed's co-founder and CEO, Johan, or Jonah Peretti, uh, said in an internal memo, As our strategy evolves, we need to evolve our organization too, particularly our business team, which was built to support direct sold advertising, but will need to bring in different, more diverse expertise. What the hell does that even mean? So what? Uh, the younger generation that you're gearing this to, is it young enough? Is that what I'm getting from this? You're not hip with the times? Nobody's hip with the times. 
Rappers aren't even hip with the times. They claim to be, but nobody is. Fads are a fleeting thing. 15 minutes of fame. Remember that. Uh, the major miss puts the possibility of a public stock offering originally planned for 2018 in doubt. Wait, you were planning stock? Oh, God, that really hurts. That, that, that's disturbing more now. Uh, BuzzFeed is backed by major investors, including Comcast owned uh, Comcast owned NBC Universal. Oh yay! Um, Harris Ventures and Anderson Horowitz. NBC Universal's latest investment in 2016 was reportedly 400 million. Bringing the value of the company to about $1.7 billion. The New York-based company founded in 2006 has been one of the leading digital media companies. <laughs> then why is it whenever I go online and look up news, I instantly get taken to Google or any other... BuzzFeed isn't even in the top 15 Whenever I look for a news, whenever I look for a news, something news related, BuzzFeed isn't even in the top fifteen on my list of. Oh yeah, I gotta look up a news topic. Uh, BuzzFeed not even in the top fifteen. I I'm serious on that. It is not even in the top fifteen choices, and that to me is kind of bad. When you're getting beat out by the Washington Post, the New York Times, the New Yorker. A newspaper in California that I've never heard about, and some website that comes out of Greenland. I can officially say you are not the top researcher. You are not one of the top media companies. Maybe for people that know about you and, you know, religiously flock to you like the dedicated people they are, but if it's a casual person, they're only going to know you as a joke, and that's how I know you as a joke. I know you as BuzzFeed, the company that I have to take anything I read on that with a grain of salt. Yeah. So, <coughs> there you go. That's the whole BuzzFeed thing. I mean, I'm not a big fan of BuzzFeed. I don't use it unless I have to, and I really don't ever use it. I've seen it. I've reversed it at least once or twice. Like I said, not a fan. I think I got like maybe one or two topics on there for the podcast, but they were already pretty much confirmed on another site. So, yeah, I, I was pretty good. But no, BuzzFeed, like I said, to me is pretty much a joke. It's the ever-growing joke of the world. But that's hilarious. They want to have stock like Facebook and Twitter and... Google and everything else. Yeah, okay. That works out well for you. Good luck with that. You're laying off 100 employees. But then again, you're laying them off. So you're not actually firing their asses. So they could be giving their jobs back if the company improves. Laying off, at least as far as I was ever told and ever taught, when you're laid off, that means that you're not technically fired. They have no work for you. While you're still technically, that they have a spot for you, there's nothing for you to do. Or they're restructuring it to see if your position and your spot will still be there. At least that's how I always interpreted laying off to be. I might be wrong. I don't know. That's how I always interpreted laying off to be. I interpret fired as your position is gone. There is no, it's no longer going to be here. See that door? We're cementing that thing shut, and this is becoming a break room for the yoga studio next door. That's what I consider fired. I don't consider laying off fired. So th there's a huge world of difference there. So I mean, they might get their jobs back if their plan to fix everything goes well, and they can, you know, revive their deficit they're going to lose. But they're not technically fired, they're laid off. So that's a difference. If they were fired, that means that they're cementing the offices that they were in and turning them into closet space or something. 
that's how I interpret firing. I don't interpret it as, oh, well, we're um eliminating your position. We're uh we're not going to meet our goals, so we have to restructure this to see if we're still going to have need for you. So we have no need for you right now, so you're we're laying you off. Fired, on the other hand, is clean out your desk. Avoid the uh, storage cabinets. You ain't going to steal nothing out of that. And you see those elevator doors? You go into those. You turn around. You wave goodbye as you push the button to go down to the first floor because your ass is gone. That's what I consider fired. So, yeah, there's a huge world of difference. But if they're laying them off, that means they have a chance to possibly get their jobs back if they can figure out a way to improve the company. But otherwise, like I said, it's BuzzFeed. And it's a digital media company. I'm going to quote somebody here that said that digital media, and once I don't even know who said it to be 100% honest, but I know I heard it from somebody. That digital media is an industry that will constantly change and evolve over time. It is not something that some person's going to come up with a brilliant idea and they're going to rule that brilliant idea for the next 70, 80 years. Someone's going to come up with an idea, somebody else is going to see that same idea, figure out a way to improve it, do that, and then there goes person A. When it comes to technology and digital stuff, that's what happens. Person A creates something. Person B sees what person A did, decides, I can do that, rips off the idea for person A, tweaks it just enough so they can't get sued, that it's different than person A's and better than person A's, and then they now became person A, and person A is now basically dust in the wind. And then the cycle just keeps on going further and further down the road. So, like I said, it's not that I want to be horrible about this and that I'm being, you know, completely inept to their problems. Yes, laying off is horrible. It means you're losing an income source. But in all honesty, it's a digital media company. You're running and you're rolling the dice now as to whether or not you're even going to have your job each and every day. I mean, it could come to a point where they could go or they could have just said, uh, yeah, no, we're, we're done. We're done. You're gone. Don't call us. We won't call you. And that's the end of it, and you're screwed. So, yeah, like I said, those are the ones that I would be a little weary about. But otherwise, if they can fix their problems and everything, you might get your jobs back. So all hope isn't technically lost. So don't go jumping off the deep end just yet. But, yeah, it is sad. I will admit that. But, you know, there's always hope. It's always darkest before the dawn. This portion of the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast is brought to you by the internet, electricity, the air, the sky, the sun, the universe, the galaxy, the particles that make up that galaxy, and whatever alien race decides to invade us next. Come on, Vulcans! Live long and prosper! Alright, so who remembers back to the good old days? Back in last year, or a few years ago, or better yet, who remembers back to 2008? Do you remember that far back? Do we remember all the good stuff that used to happen back then? Well, if you do, good news for you. Bakugan is coming back with a new TV series. That's right, Bakugan. Not to be confused with Bakuman, a manga series and anime series that I very much enjoy. Though I wish the anime series would have been finished dubbed in English. Damn you, Media Blasters. But anyway... Yes, I have a hate rant for those people. A pure hate boner. But anyway, uh... Ben Godboy's uh, global president and COO... It's chief, it's chief something or other, of Canadian toy and media company Spin Master. Oh, did not know they were Canadian. Hey, you learn something new every day. Uh, revealed that Spin Master's Q3 financial results conference, or quarter three, by the way, call on November 8th that the company is planning to revive the Bakugan franchise within the next two years. First off, I don't even know what died. I mean, I figured it when I didn't see any more of the toys lining the shelves at Target or Walmart. And I figured, okay, it's dead. I was fine with that. I mean, I got my fun out of it. I collected some of the little magnet 
things, and that's what it is. It's basically a little ball that you roll on a metal surface, the magnet attaches to the metal surface, and it pops open, revealing the monster that's hidden within. It was a pain in the ass, though, to constantly try to find one that you were looking for, because they didn't have names on the freaking packaging. So you had to look at that, and you had to memorize the picture from the show, or you had to have a camera phone with the picture functionality and took a picture of it going, nope, this is what it looks like in ball form, so this is the one I'm looking for. Yep, okay, here it is. I found it. That's what you had to do. I mean, I have still have them yet. I keep them isolated from any technology because they are magnetic. I have an Iron Man one that I scored at Target, and I do enjoy that. But here's what um, was quoted. <coughs> so here we go. They were quoted as or he was quoted as saying, "This is gonna be fun. Uh, we are also working on several exciting TV shows in our entertainment groups or group for 2018 and 2019, including Bakugan, which we are working hard on with our partners of both the toy line and TV show." Spin Master provided no other information, though, on the brand during the conference call. So, interesting. Bakugan's been gone for a few years, and all of a sudden we're going to bring it back. Don't get me wrong, I did appreciate it. It was one of those few cartoons that people constantly mistook for an anime. Here's the thing. It's not an anime. It looks like it. It smells like it. But I don't think it is. I don't think it actually qualified as an anime. But that's sad. But still, at the same time, it was a good show. I, you will not hear me argue that. Yes, sure, the plot did kind of get sort of stupid. Certain episodes. Uh, one entire series, in all honesty, I bought one thing from, and that was it. And that was the last and final one. Uh, it did spun a uh, spinoff, which I have seen on uh, YouTube. That actually wasn't too bad. I did like the spinoff. I thought that was pretty cool, but I only saw one episode of it and haven't really gotten around to trying to check out any other episodes of it. Uh, Spin Master then, back in 2015, announced that it was planning a relaunch of Bakugan at the time, though, they shared concept art. The whole Bakugan franchise is based on Spin Master and Sega toys, combination of metal cards and marble-like magnetic toys that automatically transform into figures during gameplay. Or Bakugan roll, Bakugan stand, and it that's what it does. If you can basically roll it over a piece of metal, like a very like a bed stand, a spoon. A clipboard holder that's metal. Anything metal will instantly pop that thing open. I remember my mom used to work as a cafeteria lady. As a cafeteria aide at uh, an elementary school. And the kids would constantly bring those in. And the one day, uh, they had a meeting after work. And the principal confiscated some of them. And she's trying to open one of these. And my mom goes, do you have something metal? She just plopped it right down on the metal item. And poof, it opened right up. And they're like, how did you know this? Yeah, my son collects these things. So I learned a lot of this stuff from him. <laughs> Which is true, I did collect. In fact, to me, I still do. You can find them on eBay. It's just a pain in the ass to ship those damn things, or I'd sell the ones that I have. But then again, I kind of like the collection that I have, though there are a few that I would like to have. Uh, I got rid of Maxis Dragonoid, mostly because of its size. It's X amount of pieces that form one piece, and it just took up so much room in the little container that I have for them that it just, it bugged me. Then again, this is almost like the one toy that I do have, uh, beat -em on or beat -em man which actually was pretty cool. It's a little marble shooter. I still own the, I still have the one that I, still have the few of them that I bought, so it is pretty cool. So, um, anyway, the franchise has been a bestseller in North America, and it won... Honors at Toy Fair's annual Toy of the Year Award in 2009. And I will admit, it was a pretty cool toy for, for the time. 
Cartoon Network, though, began showing the first Bakugan Battle Brawlers anime series. Oh, okay, it does qualify as an anime, then. All right, I didn't know if it qualified as an anime, because it has to be made in Japan to qualify as an anime, because that's why certain series made in Canada and the U.S. don't qualify, even though they have an anime feel. Avatar, Korra, Code Lyoko... Sorry, if it's not made in Japan, it doesn't qualify as anime, regardless if it looks like anime. If it quacks like a duck and looks like a duck, or if it sounds like a duck and quacks like a duck, it might be a fish. You never know. Of course, at that point, that'd be very scary to think about. Um, but they uh started showing it back in 2008. I do remember watching the first episode of it, and I was captivated. I thought it was really cool. Uh, it would be a few months later I would get my hands on the original first series and first sets of those. And back then, and I, I can vouch for this, they were tiny. I bought a starter pack that was about 10 bucks on sale at my local Toys R Us. And it w they, they were tiny. I mean, I could literally stick all of them in my pocket on my pants and I could forget about them. They were that tiny. I mean, they were small. But then as they got better and better, as the series progressed and they made newer ones and they were bigger, and I'm like, okay, see, now this is more like it. It can fit a little more comfortably in my hand, but the original ones were tiny. If you have any of those, you'll know what I mean. They were tiny. Uh, it was followed by three sequel television series, Bakugan, Battle Brawlers, New Vestroya, which was not that great. That's the one that introduced um, Maxis Dragonoid. Bakugan Gundalian Invaders. Some pre yeah, yeah, New Vistroya was that. Yeah, New Vistroya was the one with uh, Maxis Dragonoid. Gundalian Invaders. Uh, I don't remember which that one was. And Bakugan Mectanium Surge. That was the one that had the... Uh, uh, the really big uh, mechs that, came, that were able to be summoned. That was actually pretty cool, and I own one of those mechs. Uh, Zedthon, the red one. Because I just thought that was really cool. And that actually qualifies like a little action figure, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it was the last of which premiered in Canada and in the United States back in 2011. Baku Tech, Bakugan Gachi, a spin off series adapting a manga by Shingo, premiered in Japan in 2013. And like I said, I have seen. Uh, one episode of that, it is not bad, but I haven't seen anything, I haven't seen any more of it, so I can't really judge by it. But all in all, if they're going to revive the Bakugan series, I'm behind that. I mean, I did like the Bakugan series. That was pretty cool. Then again, you're also talking to the person here. I got fascinated with Yu-Gi-Oh! when I first saw it when Cartoon Network did a, hey, here's an entirely new list of shows that... We might get our hands on. Here's a special Friday preview of a new series that's coming to the U.S. And it was the very first Yu-Gi-Oh! episode, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters. The original Yu-Gi-Oh! was uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! as it's been dubbed by the fans, Season Zero, which is very dark, uh, but very entertaining. I will give you that. The uh, Yami games, or the Yami No games, or the Shadow games are quite entertaining to see. But you can understand why that was never going to get approved in the U.S. for kids. But Duel Monsters got approved, and it really was good. It was well made. I did enjoy it. Because when I saw that, and I started watching it, I was back, I was in like 7th grade when that came out. I actually started drawing fake Yu-Gi-Oh cards in notebooks. Like, I'm drawing up and creating my own ideas for monsters, because I thought this was so freaking cool. And then a year later... I got my hands on some of the cards, and I have a collection that's grown ever since. Yeah, so there you go. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of get hooked on whatever something interests me. I got hooked on Cubics, and that was another show that Cartoon Network showed off first. I got hooked on a few dozen other programs. Things like that are what uh, tweak my mind and interest me. Metabots was something that interests me, and I really wish... They would bring that back. That I would like to see again. Like a revamp of Metabots. Or better yet, even a new Metabots game for like tablets or uh, handheld consoles. Something like that. That would be really cool to see again. You know, hint, hint out there for all of you game designers. 
a Metabot game. Tablets could really use a good Metabots customization robot fighting game. Hint, hint. Think about it. I could create one, but I don't got the time or the skill. Hint, hint. But anyway, like I said, if they're going to bring back Bakugan, I'm looking forward to that. Granted, I can't watch it. I don't have cable. But in all honesty, I could just as easily pull it up on YouTube. Somebody will put it up on YouTube, and I can just watch it on that. So either way, I'm kind of excited for that. I do think that's a great idea if they're going to do that. I like the idea. I liked Bakugan. It really is a good series. If I do recommend if you get a chance, check it out. But personally, if you don't want to sit through all the boring explaining and dialogue through the battles, because that is the one drawback of the show. Watch an AMV of it. That's an animated music video. Just watch one of those, and it will... It's like better music, and you can just watch the battle and not have to listen to them talking and having dialogue. It's beautiful. Uh, there was a couple games that came out for it, um, mostly for the Nintendo DS. I think one came out for the PlayStation 2 or the Wii U or the Wii. Don't quote me, but I know that there are a few games out there, so they are sort of easy to find on the secondary markets like eBay and Amazon. So check those out if you're interested or YouTube them. If you have a console that can play it, if you want to check it out, go ahead. If not, seriously, just check out like an NAMV of it. It's the battles are what the whole series is about. It's really cool battles between basically toys and mythical creatures. It's really cool. I will admit that. So you can check that out. But if they're coming out and they're going to redo this again, let's do this. Let's revive the Bakugan franchise. I can get another box to stick more of them in. I want to get some more Bakugan. It's going to make me now look up a lot of those things now on eBay, and I'm going to be curious about, huh, hey, look, I found an entire lot of these things. Hey, I wonder if there's anything good in it. I don't know. I'll have to check. But anyway, that sounds pretty cool. The Absolutely Completely Random Podcast is brought to you by electricity. Because without it, I wouldn't be able to record anything on my laptop because my battery requires it in order to run, and it needs electricity to recharge. Yeah, I know. But I can't get a water wheel in my room. Ah, uh, Apple. Oh, boy. Apple pulled one of the biggest screw-ups in computer history, and oh, boy, are they going to pay for it for eternities to come. So, for those of you that don't know what happened, let me give you a little rundown, because this was brought to my attention, ironically, by a channel that I subscribed to on YouTube that put up a video explaining what to do to temporarily help avoid a crisis with this. So, Bolt Matrix, uh, one of my subscriptions that I have on YouTube that I, list, that I watch, uh, he does a lot of toy reviews, which is why I watch... Yeah, come on, that's easy to figure out. But anyway, he put up a video explaining the Mac OS security issue. And oh boy, was it a big one. So here's the thing. If you bought the Mac, I think, yeah, okay, it was Mac High Sierra, the latest version, at least version 10.13.1 dash uh, 17. B48. If you typed in root in the username and no password, is you just typed in R O O T, no password, and you know hit enter, return, or whatever it is on Max, you can literally bypass all of the security, all security screens. Everything you would bypass it all, and that is a humongous issue. That is huge. How in the hell that managed to get through, I don't know. That is huge. But Apple, let's be happy for once that I think the late Steve Jobs will be happy that his company that he started 
at least has the common sense to go, um, we done screwed up. Because this is huge. So, what Apple's done is they have released a security update for Mac OS High Sierra. And everybody that has that, update, update it now. Uh, Apple will automatically push the security patch later on. This was, uh, I think I got this Thursday, I want to say. Yeah, Thursday, I think. <coughs> so it should be pushed by now, but if it isn't, update, 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 update. So in order to install the new update, you're going to need to uh, open the Mac App Store, click on the Updates tab. Interestingly, the release notes say... Install this update as soon as possible. Apple has worked long hours to fix uh, the major flaw as soon as possible. But it shouldn't have happened in the first place. I mean, honestly, anybody could have logged into your freaking Mac computer, MacBook, laptop, whatever you want to call it. All they had to do was type in root and the username, no password, and there you go. And it was just, I find it so hilariously stupid that this happened, but at the same time, scary as crap. I mean, this is something that if Windows would pull this crap, I would be livid in the first 30 seconds. I would want somebody's head on a platter, and my laptop would never leave my hands. I would freaking sleep with it. The only time it would not be touching me is when I'm taking a shower, but I would be looking past the shower curtain. You're still there? Good. You're still there? Good. You're still there? Good. So that's what could happen. You just typed in root in the username, no password, and boom. Instant access bypassing all security screens. Multiple persons at TechCrunch tested the flaw, and it could replicate it effortlessly. Well, yeah, when a freaking toy reviewer decides to show this for everybody because this is huge, and I will admit, this is a big screw-up. That's something you can take to the bank. This isn't the, oops, um, we have a day one bug. This is a, oops, we done screwed up big time. So... You can see everything on somebody else's computer, even if it's not your computer. And it worked with uh, screen sharing sessions. And for hackers, this was basically a hacker's wet dream. Honestly, any hacker out there, this was a wet dream for them. It's like, how many hackers probably took advantage of this? Honestly, when news of this hit the internet... I guarantee you there were hackers all over the world going, okay, find every single person that's got one of these. We're hacking the crap out of them tonight. I guarantee it. This is a hacker's wet dream. That a big company like Apple screws up this big, this high of a magnitude screw up. That is saying something. So... The patch release, uh, it's quite short. A logic error uh, existed in the validation of credentials, and it was addressed with improved credential validation, according to Apple. Apple is automatically rolling out the update for everyone who is affected and has provided the following statement. <clears throat> Security is a top priority for every Apple product. And regrettably, we stumbled with this release of Mac OS. No, no, no. You didn't stumble. You fell hard to the ground, busted your kneecaps, and you're crawling on your hands and knees begging for forgiveness. This, this isn't a stumble. This is you teetering off of a cliff in a Humvee or a Hummer. Going 90 miles an hour with 17 canisters of gasoline in the back and a full tank of gas. And if you know Hummers and Humvees, those things suck up fuel like I suck up Dr. Pepper. It's fast. 
Uh, when our security engineers became aware of the issue Tuesday afternoon, we immediately began working on an update that closes the security hole. This morning, as of 8 a.m., and this was, like I said, a few days ago when I got this article, uh, the update is available for download. But starting later today, it will be automatically installed on all systems running the latest version. 10.13.1 of Mac OS High Sierra. We greatly regret this error and we apologize to all Mac users, both for releasing with this vulnerability and for the concern it has caused. Our customers deserve better and we're auditing our development process to help prevent this from happening again. So basically, they're firing the quality control person and let that slip right past their fingers. Honestly, how do you how do you manage to get through this? That's going to be great for that person trying to find another job. All right, so why'd you get fired from Apple? If you don't mind my asking. Um, I was responsible for the Mac OS High Sierra vulnerability. Get out. I don't know. Get out. They are not. They are gonna basically get in, be getting a job stocking shelves somewhere. For, that's to be said. Cause this isn't a simple slap on the wrist. Okay, you, you did y'all. You did bad. I'm slapping your wrist. You did bad. But we're gonna let. No, no. This is a full. This is a firing right here. This is a. We're boarding up your office. We're changing the locks. Your key card's not gonna work anymore. Get the beep out. That's what this is. Quality control screwed the pooch on this. Big time. Huge big time. Screwed the pooch on this 100%. This is something that if I would screw up this royally, if I worked at a tech company, I would pretty much just go in the next morning, clean off my desk, walk right by the office of my boss and go, yeah, I, I cleaned my desk out. I, I, I'm just going to walk right out. You want to have security follow me out so I don't try to make it a scene or something? I, I'm all for it, but I'm taking full responsibility for this screw up. Um, I, I apologize, but uh, yeah, I'm going to go out the door now. Um, thank you for the opportunity and I am really sorry I screwed up because damn, that is a huge screw up. That is a ginormous screw up. I mean, how did this, if this would have gotten released, first off, like I said, hacker's wet dream. This is a hacker's wet dream. Honestly, they could have easily made a crap ton of hacks off of this. <coughs> and, and what's sad about this is any two-bit hacker, any elementary school student could have done this. You could have a five-year-old that just wants to find out what his older brother or sister or, you know, her older brother or sister are doing. Their older brother or sister, their older siblings. You could see what they want to do. All of a sudden, it's like, hey, look, all I got to type in is R-O-O-T, nothing else. Oh, cool, I'm in their computer. All right, let's see what they've been doing. Oh, what's this? Huh, I wonder if this is that site that mom was yelling at them about the other night. Oh, I wonder if it's any good. Yeah, I see multiple, multiple problems with this. Honestly, how how do you manage to screw up this big? This is one of the worst screw-ups I think Apple has done in ages. I mean, ages. You had tech companies that screw up coming out with a new product, like Microsoft and their freaking Zune, or... Um, oh god, what's, what was another really bad one? Um, oh, Samsung and their uh, Galaxy Note 7. Huge screw-ups like that. Pale in comparison to an actual company that creates computers, operating systems, and things of this nature, basically leaving the back door wide open for everybody to come in and just go, yeah, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. Yeah, I pretty much own this entire home now. How you manage to get away with this, not... If they manage to come out of this smelling like roses at the other end, that will be a miracle. 
If they manage to get away from this without it hurting their name and dragging it through the dirt, that will be a miracle. Honestly, I don't see that happening. I see them getting screwed royally with this. No way, shape, or form. They are doomed. They're boned on this one. This is going to hurt them big time. And I just, oh, God. I just can't believe that actually happened. So, like I said, if you have Mac OS High Sierra version 10.13.1, update it immediately! I mean immediately! Pause this video, update it immediately, and then come back and finish listening to me. <laughs> but seriously, that is scary! I mean, that is scary as hell that that happened. I mean it. That is just... That, that is terrifying. Alright, let's go back over to the land of the rising sun, shall we? So, Ichisu... Uh, yeah, let me try that again. Ichi... Shimitsu... And uh, Tomohiro... Shimoguchi's series that centers on Shin Hayata's son... Well, if you don't know what that means, Ultraman Manga is getting an anime in 2019. There you go. The countdown is on. Cue the Europe, cue Europe and sing it now. Uh, the countdown is on the official website for Ultraman Manga, which ended on Friday, and revealed that the series is getting an anime adaptation in 2019. Woo! I actually like Ultraman, so I'm not really against this. Ultraman really is kind of cool. I like Ultraman. I like Gridman. I like the Super Sentai. I like that Monster of the Week crap. Uh, in Jan uh, the January 2018 issue of Shu Shogaku Shogaku Khan's monthly Heroes magazine also revealed the anime on Friday. Magazine has tested a major announcement, or has teased a major announcement, for the manga on the same day. Additionally, the issue published a special one-shot manga for Shimitsu and Shimiguchi's Line Barrels of Iron manga, which will ship the first volume of its complete edition on December 5th. Ooh. Viz Media publishes the Ultraman manga in North America, and it describes the story as follows. <clears throat> Decades ago, a being known as the Giant of Light joined Shin Hayata of the Scientific Special Research Special Search Party to save Earth from an invasion of terrifying monsters known as Kaiju. Now, many years later, those dark days are fading into memory, and the world is at peace. But in the shadows, a new threat is growing. A danger that can only be faced by a new kind of hero. A new kind of Ultraman. Shinjiro is an ordinary teenager, but his father is the legendary Shin Hayata. He learn, when he learns that his father passed on the Ultraman factor to him, and that he possesses incredible power, nothing will ever be the same again. Just in case anybody wants me to take over for the guy that keeps going in a world, I am available. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, actually, this is pretty cool. But anyway, uh, it's not too bad, not too shabby. Like I said, I do like Ultraman. It is pretty cool. Uh, the Lion Barrels of Iron uh, team launched their series based on... Sup I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It's uh, Su Buyara... Yeah, Subiyara's uh, Subiyara Productions' most famous live-action special effects hero in Monthly Heroes magazine in 2011. Uh, Shuga Shoga Kaku or Kukan uh, published the manga's tenth compiled book volume on July 5th, and will ship the eleventh volume on December 5th. Viz Media. Oh man, you have your hands in everything. The manga's ninth volume on December on October seventeenth, and the tenth volume is slated to ship on May eighteenth. If memory serves, Line Barrel 
a uh, line barrels of iron is also an anime series check out the anime series i know i've seen trailers for it i've seen pictures of it i have listened to the opening i know it's an anime series check that out too but otherwise this is some good news coming to you from the land of the rising sun Yes, the land of the rising sun does bring us some good news this time around. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, she got a uh, Gridman getting an anime series, which I'm really excited about. You have <clears throat> Ultraman getting an anime series. You know what? While we're at it, let's go with the Super Sentai and Kamen Rider getting an anime series. And let's just get all four of the best fighting shows and the best action shows in Japan that are live action, and let's get them all together and make a manga adaptations and anime adaptations, and let's get on with it! Seriously, that seems to be what we're leaning towards and what we're headed towards, and in all honesty, I am fine with that. I honestly am. I have no issues, I have no quarrels about that, so I would really be looking forward to this if it happened. But otherwise... So that's something to look forward to in 2019. Sad we have to wait an extra year, but it's not too bad. I mean, 2018 might suck, so 2019 at least has something good to look forward to, so long as it doesn't end up blowing chunks. But then again, you never know. If you're looking for collectibles, oddities, things you just don't ever see anywhere else, or that you want to have for conversation starters, check out A Roads 2012 on eBay. I've got a tremendous amount of stuff. And, well, I'm A Roads 2012. I'm also Andrew Rhodes, the host of the absolutely completely random podcast, Andrew Rants and Andrew's Theories, here on YouTube. So make sure you check out A Roads 2012 on eBay for all your trading card needs. And other oddities, too. You never know. I might have something that might just interest you. Okay, so sad news for people that like the site VidMe. Um, it's shutting down. It shut down. It shuts down. Uh, it's user-generated video service, citing inability to compete with Google and Facebook. You can't fight Google! Come on! Uh, Startup VidME is shutting down its user-based generated its user-generated video service because it can't see a way to make money in the face of internet giants Google and Facebook. Well, in all honesty, I want to say this: at least they're admitting they can't do this. They're admitting that okay, we're not going to try to take on these two behemoths. We can't beat them. Google owns YouTube. YouTube will kill us. We are not going to win. Uh, new signups and uploads to the VidMe site and apps will be disabled Friday. And the service... Well, this would have been yesterday, by the way. And the service will be shut down December 15th at noon Pacific time, according to the company. In addition, effective immediately... All paid VidMe channel subscriptions will be suspended. And subscriber-only videos will be exclusively accessible by their video owners. The company said any outstanding earnings will be paid to verified creators within 60 days. Founded back in 2014, the company had described its platform as a hybrid of YouTube and Reddit. Yeah, there you go. With videos curated by community members in different in different categories. Unfortunately, we didn't see a path to sustainability and an independent VOD platform. Video on demand, I'm assuming. In the face of competition from both Google and Facebook, VidMe co-founder Warren Schaefer said in an email. The crux of the problem, according to... Schaefer, uh, VidMe is lacking or lacked critical mass in terms of its audience size relative to YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Of course, you don't have the Kardashians to make them Instagram hoes. Because that's how Instagram got popular was the Kardashians. 
Facebook got popular because of Zuckerberg and his <clears throat> questionable taste. And YouTube got popular because of everybody goes to YouTube. It's called YouTube. It's not called MeTube. It's called YouTube. Seriously. Uh, so it struggled to attract uh, direct advertisers to help offset uh, our infrastructure costs, leaving few resources to spend on product innovations and attracting new audience. He wrote in a blog post on Friday. According to Schaefer, the company still has a significant amount of its funding available and plans to announce a new product next year, though he declines to provide details. He didn't got none. In all honesty, that is a bluff. I can smell that a mile away. That's a bluff. Well, we got something new coming out next year. Eyes are probably darting back and forth when he said that. Meanwhile, he's hoping to cut a deal with a creator-focused company that might incorporate the VidMe technology in some new form in the future. <coughs> With the shutdown of the UGC platform, VidMe is laying off four full-time employees. Remember, laying off. Different than fired. At one point, VidMe claimed to have nearly 1 million registered creators and more than 25 million unique monthly users. All told, according to the company, it delivered 6 billion views over its lifetime. And the platform's most popular creators we're earning thousands of dollars per month. Why did I not know about this service sooner? I could have made money. Nah. It's not worth it at that point. But anyway, uh, that was the article. Now, I did find some more information on the wonderful world of Dr. Seuss here. So, this was, I'm believing, the pod the blog post that was put up so bear with me I'm going to read this I haven't even had a chance to fully read this so bear with me here uh, goodbye for now FidMe came a long way as an independent platform but we couldn't find a path to sustainability we're building something new after careful consideration the VidMe team has arrived at the difficult decision to suspend the VidMe site and apps effective December 15th at noon pacific time We'll use this blog post to explain what this means for users, how we got here, and what's next for us. So what this means for users. New signups and uploads will be disabled effective today. Existing videos will be playable and exportable from your video manager until December 15th at noon Pacific time, at which point they will be permanently deleted from the VidMe servers. All paid channel subscriptions will be suspended immediately, and subscriber-only videos will be exclusively accessible by their uh, by their video owners. Any outstanding earnings will be paid out upon verification within 60 days. All VidMe paid subscriptions will cease as of today, and subscribers will no longer be billed. Uh, please see their FAQ for more details and email them at a help. Uh, hello at vid.me with any questions. Why they started VidMe? They started VidMe initially uh, before we could afford to shorten the domain, which was vid was v i d d m e in 2014, with the mission of helping the next generation of entertainers find their audience and earn a living. Yeah, that's what YouTube was doing for a while until they screwed the pooch on that. At the time, YouTube was the only major platform that provided revenue sharing. I just said that. A system which often neglected creators with small or niche audiences. Aw, oh, you're speaking my language. We were confident that we could create a new type of video platform. One that was more community-oriented, more transparent, and more equatable to creators. Inspired by Reddit's crowd, cer <laughs> crowd curation... We also saw an opportunity to improve the experience for both viewers and curators. 
by allowing the community to surface trending content. Given the large market opportunity, video ad spend is 848 in the U.S. alone. It doesn't say if it's dollars or million, billion what. Or thousand, doesn't say. But the impending shift from linear television viewing towards digital video, we believe that we could create a sustainable platform to accomplish these goals. What they accomplished. VidMe's original feature was a one-step video publishing tool. Simply drag and drop your file and VidMe would generate a short link to your video that you could share anywhere. No account required. VidMe original homepage at the time, sharing videos was more difficult than it is today. Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and other large platforms didn't have native video. It was often impossible to send large files over SMS, Sims, and YouTube required sign-in and publishing to your G Plus page. VidMe's simple one-step video upload drove massive early adaption and traffic. Adoption and traffic. Uh, you don't need Google Plus page to up to publish YouTube videos. You just need an account to do that, and it's free. On a mission to build the world's most creator-friendly video community, we raised venture funding and quickly evolved the product to support creators with a broader set of tools for publishing, building audience, and monetizing. The first VOD platform to offer both on-platform tipping and paid subscription. VidMe became one of the top 1,000 most popular destinations on the web, reaching over 200 million people annually. We hosted millions of videos, delivered over 6 billion views to audiences around the world, and our player was frequently embedded by major online publications, including the Huffington Post, USA Today, Mashable, People, Sports Illustrated, and more. Our small engineering team developed infrastructure that scaled to support thousands of simultaneous HD video episodes, or encodes, and hundreds of thousands of concurrent viewers. Most importantly, our vision for a more equitable and creator-friendly community attracted some of the world's most talented creators, ranging from first-time videographers yeah, videographers with a passion for storytelling to well-established digital stars with millions of subscribers. Some were earning thousands of dollars per month using VidMe's fan patronage tools, and many found larger audiences than they ever had before. An energetic and diverse community took shape with VidMe's most ardent fans creating thousands of of videos discussing the platform. All this was accomplished with fewer than a dozen full-time employees and in spite of increasing competition for audience attention from the likes of Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon, we began spending billions of dollars per year on video content. <clears throat> There's your first problem. Meanwhile, deeper pocketed platforms such as Vine, owned by Twitter, and Vessel folded and Verizon's Go90 struggled to find comparable traction despite spending hundreds of millions of dollars. What we learned and why we're moving on to something new. Although we still believe that the world would greatly benefit from a creator-first video platform, we aren't able to find a path to financially sustainability. Here are major obstacles we encountered in our attempt. Monetizing user-generated content is increasingly challenging. Advertisers want to target specific audiences, which means a new platform that doesn't store droves or troves of personal user data is at a server's a severe disadvantage relative to Facebook and Google, which combined control 60% of online ad spending in the U.S. Most advertisers want their ads to complement brand safe content. Unfortunately, this is a subject subjective designation which is difficult to define and enforce. 
Content, therefore, must be thoroughly reviewed and moderated. And expensive prospects, as YouTube recently learned with the Adpocalypse. Even a single poorly moderated video can result in a PR disaster and undermine advertiser trust. Remember why Lyft yanked all their ads off of, t off of YouTube. Few advertisers are willing to negotiate direct deals with platforms that don't have enormous scale, meaning ad revenue rates are lower for newer platforms. In turn, there's less overall revenue to be shared with creators, which means creators are less likely to support newer platforms for a sustained period of time. Although we introduced direct fan patron patronage, as an additional business model, the profit margin was insufficient to cover the high cost of storing and delivering video. Storing and delivering video is becoming less expensive, but remains extremely costly. Videos are often massive files, and making them globally available at any time is expensive. YouTube sold to Google just 18 months after launching, partially because of YouTube's high burn rate and to this day is still likely operating at a loss. Yeah, my ass! You want to watch a freaking show on YouTube that you can watch on TV, it costs you like two ninety nine. You're going to pay to pull up some of their movies. But yeah, pfft, operating at a loss, my ass! But it just goes on like this. Uh, saying that when they launched in 2014, they projected that infrastructure costs would decline due to increased competition in the CDN and data storage industries. While marginal prices have fallen dramatically over the past few years, our accretive costs still outpaced our ability to generate meaningful revenue. And so on and so forth. They go on to explain... Um, sorry for yawning there. They go on to explain that it's basically, as far as I can tell with this, as I, like I said, I did, I glanced over some of it earlier, so that's why I said I didn't read it, I glanced over it. Basically explaining, okay, this is why we're getting rid of this, this is why we're going away, we're not, you know, making enough money, we're not getting ads to come in because we're not making a lot of viewers, we have to, they don't want their ads to be on something that's painful. So you don't want to have an ad for a diaper in a video where somebody's ranting about the diaper breaking. You don't want to have a commercial for a garage next to a video, you know, with a video where the person is going, I took my car to this garage to get fixed, and $18,000 later, I find out they punctured a hole in my oil pan or something. <clears throat> That's what they don't want, and I understand that. It is understandable. Keep in mind... That was one of the reasons why YouTube yanked off the um, ad revenue for channels under 10,000 lifetime views was because of that. They wanted to make sure that they're not going to be getting you know ads for people that are screwing up. I mean, you can't just create a clickbait channel and expect to get ads. It's never going to work. Not now anymore. Maybe a couple years ago, yeah, but not now anymore. Everything does change because everything evolves. It has to go with the flow and increase itself. Yes, Adpocalypse does suck because majority of the time, uh, I know Larry Bundy Jr. over on uh, his channel can vouch for this dramatically. That if a video even smells off to YouTube, they won't monetize it. And a lot of these creators, the videos being monetized is their only source of income. So it's understandable if the video doesn't get monetized, they're losing money. And that's understandable that that sucks. But at the same time, yeah, I understand the concept of it. It does blow. It does suck. I'm not going to say it doesn't. But, yeah, it's understandable. Is it sad? Yes. That a company has to go and shut itself down because it can't compete with the Giants. What it's doing, basically what the Giants were doing a few years ago. So yes, it does kind of suck, but that's the world we live in now. Where you have to be, you know, you have to make sure the videos you put up, if you want to make money on them, are nice, polite, they're not bad-mouthing anything in particular, and so on and so forth. I mean, when I put up my very first rant video, 
it came up and told me cannot be monetized, cannot be monetized, cannot be monetized. I actually had to click that review thing because back then I could still get monetization. Not now anymore because I don't have it. They fixed their error as they called it. I don't honestly, I figured, hey, this would be a good incentive to try to get people to maybe put more stuff up here. But then again, I was making like two cents. So I wasn't really making anything. But still, I still do my videos for the heck of it. But yeah, it is sad that VidMe has to shut down. It's sad that they're going away for this. Hopefully they come back with a new business model. They figure out how to do this just right, justify everything, and can come back stronger than they were. But in other words, otherwise, let's face it, I mean, the content creators on YouTube were complaining years ago that YouTube is changing. That's all they kept saying. YouTube's changing, YouTube's changing, YouTube's changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything changes. The seasons change. The sky changes. Everything changes. It's a freaking kid's book, people. Everything changes. And if it isn't, then I'm sure as hell going to write that book. Everything changes. A book about puberty, seasons, everything. Back to B. Note to self, create kid's book. You heard it here first, folks. I came up with the idea. If it already exists, I didn't come up with it. But if it didn't exist, I came up with it. I want that on the record. But, yeah, it is sad, and I hope that things do improve for him. I, re I really do. All right, folks. It's the final topic of the night. My final topic. Yeah, this podcast has gone a little long. Although I think I'll probably add an hour. If not, I don't know. But anyway, yep. Yeah, final topic I have for the night. Shonen Jump reveals its poster for the 90s retrospective exhibition. And this poster is pretty cool. I will try to get a picture of it here for you to see it. Because it is kind of cool. If not, I will link the article. If I forget, I will link the article from Otaku USA to the in the uh, description below. So I will try to get a picture though up of it because I it is a pretty cool picture. Uh, those fans will be excited to hear the news, and the fans are anybody that enjoys Dragon Ball Z, Yu Yu Hakusho, Slam Dunk, Yu Gi Oh, and many other fans of Shonen Jump. The '90s is the decade to beat. Yeah, that's up for debate, but yeah. So those fans will be excited to hear that there's an upcoming Tokyo exhibition dedicated to that era of manga of the manga magazine. Today, the first post for that exhibition, a collage of the best of 90s Shonen Jump, was unveiled. And it was, it's beautiful. I'm definitely telling you that. The exhibition, the second in a series, a second of a series celebrating the magazine's 50th anniversary will take place March 19th to June 17th, 2018, at the Mori Arts Center Gallery in... Ro okay, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this. I am going to screw this up. R-O-P-P-O-N-G-I, Tokyo. The exhibition will run from 10 a.m. to 20 p.m. Seven days a week. I'm assuming that's military time, so... I'm guessing 10 in the morning to 8 at night. If it's military time, 20 hundred hours would be 8 o'clock. So, my guess is from 10 in the morning to 8 o'clock at night. 7 days a week. 365 days a year. <laughs> uh, no, it's at least 7 days a week. Um, so, here's how the official site describes the exhibition. The Weekly Shonen Jump exhibition is an exhibit to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Weekly Shonen Jump by displaying its, found, its founding up to the present. The long-awaited second round is finally here. It is called the Weekly Shonen Jump Exhibition Volume 2, a historical 6.53 million copies in circulation. The super popular Shonen Jump heroes of the 90s, who are still loved by worldwide fans today, will all be gathered in... Rapongi? Rapongi or something? I I'm trying to pronounce it. Rapongi? I don't know. This exhibition will release the original hand-drawn illustrations and displays of the creative world of Jump's proud artists. Uh, 
Don't miss this chance to join the manga exhibition and to experience the energy and what made the record of 6.53 million copies of 1990's Weekly Shonen Jump in Japanese publishing history. Additional information and tickets can be found at the official website in English, no less. So, that's impressive. I mean, I'm a fan of Yu Yu Hakusho. I'm a fan of Dragon Ball Z. Not a fan of Slam Dunk, but I am a fan of Yu-Gi-Oh! That's for damn sure. So, yeah. It's a cool poster, I will admit that. It's going to be neat. This is something that's neat to see. This is definitely something for those that are still fans of Shonen Jump, that grew up reading Shonen Jump, passed it on to their kids, or like an older sibling that passed it on to the younger sibling. This is really cool and something that they will get a kick out of. I will admit that. So, this is something to look forward to. It's going to be next year, uh, from March 19th to June 17th, at the Mori Arts Center Gallery in Rapungi, Tokyo. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, they can. If I'm not, I apologize. It's that is the weirdest name I think I have ever heard come out of Japan. And this is a and this is a world. And this is a country that has some weird names. And this I think is about the weirdest name and weirdest thing I have ever heard come out of there. Is trying to pronounce one name of a freaking city. In Tokyo. That is impressive. And I can't even pronounce it. And I don't even think I'm pronouncing it right. That's scary. But, yeah. So I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing it. Please don't shoot me. But anyway, that's something to look forward to. You know, I, I think that's pretty cool. But, yeah. So if you find yourself over in Japan next year between March 19th and June 17th, check it out. Alrighty, folks, that is going to do it this week for the absolutely, completely random podcast. I hope you had as much fun listening to it as I had recording it. I'd like to thank Otaku USA for the news articles, as well as Facebook for the trending section, which is where I got some of the news articles, as well as the people that did the stuff for the news articles. Yay! Uh, but no, seriously though, it was a great week for articles, and I do appreciate everybody sticking around. So if you have any questions or ideas for future topics for the podcast, feel free to email them to me at acrpodcast at gmail.com, or you can send them to me at Otaku Roads on Twitter, or in the discussion section here on my YouTube page, on my YouTube channel, WebDesigner18. And... With that, I'm going to call it a night, pack up my laptop, and crawl back underneath this nice warm blanket my friend gave me. And it is so warm and snuggly. I cannot wait. I just like sleeping underneath it. It's just so warm and cuddly and snuggly. It really is. It is so nice. Can't thank her enough for that blanket. It it is a nice blanket. But anyway, folks, that's going to do it this week for the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast. My name's Andrew Rhodes. As always, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you for sticking around with me for the last hour or so, and I will catch you all next week. Have a good one, everybody.